Mm-hmm. You're listening to Is This Secure? I'm Michael. There's no Curtis. You know, Noam Chomsky hasn't said a whole lot of things that I would necessarily claim to agree with, but one of the things he does say that I wholeheartedly agree with is that sports, which are sort of akin to the Roman Colosseum mentality, are you not entertained? exist for the purpose of distracting the common man from how badly he's getting screwed over on a daily basis. And so Curtis is busy taking his mind off of just how badly he's getting screwed over on a daily basis right now. That's exactly where he's gone. Uh, That's where he's taken himself to this evening. Actually, he was planning on being here uh, tonight, and in fact, we mentioned on the previous show that we would both be here today, and then as soon as the show ended, he was like, oh, shit, I just realized I'm going to be... Only he didn't say shit, because Curtis... I've said before, Curtis is one of these people, he's so pure and nice, you just wish you were more like him. He would never say the word shit, but uh, I felt like injecting that into the conversation just for a slight element of spice for presentation to the listening audience. So Curtis is doing the Super Bowl thing. I guess he's got a room full of people over there. Um, I don't know how many people are over there. I told him, I instructed him to install a uh, an internet-connected security camera so that I could keep tabs on exactly what's happening in his living room, but uh, he never got back to me on that. Take a look at our website. It is isthissecure.com, isthissecure.com. You know, I noticed something on our website uh, the other day because what I was doing was Uh, I guess this was yesterday. I was downloading all of the episodes that have been uploaded thus far to isthissecure.com and turning them into videos so that they can then be uploaded to YouTube and listened to over there. And as I was downloading these, I found that some of them were partial files. They were entirely not complete. And I didn't, I realized this on one of them, episode three, I caught it myself. But the only reason I caught it was because the um, video rendering software crapped out about halfway through, and I thought, well, this is strange. So I (laughs) investigated just a smidge and figured out, oh, we've only got 25% of the show here, even though the file length says it's a full show. So that's just a corrupted file. You've got headers in the audio file that tell your player how long the audio file is, what's the audio format, how many channels are there, what's the bit rate, all that stuff. Your player doesn't just find that out magically. There are like there's metadata in the file that tells your player uh, what exactly it's dealing with. So apparently the file was so corrupted that it was leading the player to believe that it was playing a full show when in fact it wasn't. I felt deceived. My player felt deceived. And there was just a room full of upset people here. I have to tell you this. So when you have a hosting uh, company that, well, uh, it's a shared host, I guess, that Curtis has this on at isthissecure.com. When you have audio files that are downloading in a corrupted fashion, 50% of the time they're downloaded, that's an issue. So we're going to have to deal with that. I do have links to the RSS feed if you want to subscribe to the podcast and the app of your choice. Uh, When you look at the YouTube uploads of these shows, right there in the description, at the end of each description, you see the RSS feed. Well, I still encourage you to go ahead and subscribe to the show and plan on listening that way because once we do get the hosting situation fixed, I think Curtis is going to move it to another host. Once that's fixed, that's all going to work, those URLs for the RSS subscription, that's all going to remain the same. So go ahead and subscribe. But in the meantime, I think just listening on YouTube is probably the better way forward uh, until we get that fixed. And maybe even into the future, I don't know. I I got to thinking about this yesterday when I started uploading all this stuff. I've got like 1,100 subscribers on my YouTube channel. Now, I don't know how many of those are real people. I don't know how many are bots. Um, I've got no clue. Uh, it does seem like I'll upload a video and after a week it'll have only 150 views. So I have to suspect that the ratio of real human beings uh, to bots or just garbage is pretty suspect. But nevertheless, there have got to be more ears available 
at my YouTube channel than on our brand new website that only has four episodes posted. So uh, it made sense to go ahead and post that stuff at YouTube. But go ahead and subscribe to the RSS feed if you have an app that you use for downloading podcasts. And just know that until we get this moved over to the new host, you may have an incomplete download. It's crazy, though. I, I didn't even realize it was doing this until yesterday. We've had this thing up since, uh, what, November? <laughs> you know, we are the corporate executive at the dog food factory who's never bothered to taste the dog food. That is exactly what we are. So we'll get on to that uh, and get it taken care of at some point sometime soon. I don't know. You know what? We have lives. Uh, we'll get around to it. A former, former Google executive says Microsoft has thrown down the gauntlet on a new era of artificially intelligent web search with the launch of its upgraded version of Bing. Did you see this last week where uh, Google had a public presentation of the AI that it's going to bake into Google search? And I think they call it BARD, which people are calling it BARF. <laughs> just just to sort of stick the thumb in the eye of Google, because that's fun to do. Is it not fun to just jam, jam your finger right in his, right in his eye? I, I, as I was saying that just now, I was thinking about that South Park episode where they had uh, Steve Irwin, the animal guy, <laughs> and every animal he encounters on that show, he utters the words, I'm going to jam my finger right in his butthole. That ought to really piss him off. Hold on just a second. I need to sip this coffee. I know I'm getting older. <clears throat> Not old, but older, because now if I do funny voices, uh, my throat immediately feels like ground beef. It's either because I'm getting older or I'm dying. One of those two. <laughs> it's got to be one or the other. So Microsoft had their presentation. I, I think Google did theirs first, and it was a complete train wreck because, first of all, their AI was asked a question, and it answered incorrectly. And then one of the presenters who was supposed to demonstrate some of this decided, okay, let's go ahead and do the presentation. Let me show you what we're up to here. And she realized that she didn't have a phone <laughs> on the stage with her. And... Um, it, it was sort of akin to the, uh, I saw someone in the comments on one of the videos of this on YouTube wrote, I haven't felt this uncomfortable since uh, Konami, is that the name of the uh, gaming, uh, the game company that, it's like a uh, company that makes video games, Konami, I think that's their name. And there was this presentation in 2010 at something called E3. It's like an annual tech presentation. I think it's just like uh, video game creation studios that go there. Google that, in fact. Konami 2010 E3. And you'll find a summary where they take the highlights of this presentation, but the whole thing is just an absolute train wreck. It's one thing if you have a presentation and maybe one person flubs the thing uh, in the course of a two- or three-hour presentation, but it's quite another when every single presenter, one after the other, it's almost as if they planned it this way. I can't believe that they did, but it just sort of worked out to be the case that every presentation was awkward. Every presentation was a failure. And uh, so I recommend you look this up. Konami... 2010 E3. You'll see what I'm talking about. And someone compared the presentation of the Google AI last week to the 2010 Konami E3. I hope I'm saying the name of that company right. Konami? I think that is it. Konami. It feels right. K-O-N-A-M-I. Something like that. What's really funny is that every game that was presented at that 2010 E3 conference... I've never heard of a single one of those games. I don't think I'm not a gamer, so it would stand to reason that perhaps I haven't heard of those games, but I don't think anybody else has either. So Google had a complete and total fail with their presentation of their AI. It really was so bad, in fact, that the stock price dropped, I think it was 9 or 10%, and Google lost $100 billion of market value. From one presentation, like, can you imagine being connected to something like that where had someone just handed this woman a phone 
<laughs> had like that simple act of handing a mobile device to this woman was the difference that may have saved them 5%, let's say of market value. <laughs> Just like the handing over of this little physical candy bar sized object. Here you go. That saved the company 5% or $50 billion of market value. Just now me handing that to you, but uh, no, we would have lost 5% anyway, but this kept us from losing the other 5%. But since I didn't hand this to you, we're going to lose the full 10. That's amazing. And then Microsoft came out with their presentation. I think it was the following day that Microsoft did theirs. And it looks amazing. You, you, you've, you've thought of uh, Bing as a joke. Just the name sucks. I've Even to this day, I've never been able to hear the word Bing as it relates to Microsoft Search and not think of Bing Crosby beating his kids. That's the only thing I can think of. You named your search engine after some dude from the 50s who beat the shit out of his kids so badly that one of his kids killed themselves, the other one drank himself to death. They wrote books about how terrible their father was. You named your search engine after that. At least Google, it's like, well, who? no one can really think of anything that that reminds them of that might remind them. Didn't Doc Brown from Back to the Future use the word Google or Googleplex at one point? Uh, I think that may have been the mainstream, the first mainstream introduction of the word Google to people, which if that's the connection people made to the word Google when they heard it, well, that's not a bad connection at all. But Bing? I don't know about that. <clears throat> so anyway, my, Microsoft does their presentation. It goes fantastically. And not only did the presentation go well, but the product looks really solid. They demonstrated a really huge article. And there's a little button you can, you can tap up in the top right corner. It brings up the AI chat window. And you just ask it, summarize this article. And it summarizes the article. And then the guy asked it, okay, uh, lay that information out into a table. So then it repackages all the information into a table. And then he says, okay, uh, repackage that table where this axis is on this side and that axis is on that side with descending numbers. And I mean, just like giving it really weird specific requirements for how this information is to be laid out. And it just did it. It just did it. And I'm thinking to myself, this is going to be awesome for doing show prep, frankly, because... I will be able to just pull every article, give me the summary, print it, off I go. Next article, give me the summary, print it, off I go. That's not, don't get me wrong. I am not suggesting I do a vast amount of show prep here. That is not what I'm trying to put out there to you. I'm just simply saying that in the event that this technology were available to me, perhaps I would do a little bit more show prep, or at least the uh, amount of time that I spend doing the show prep uh, would be far more efficiently used. Uh, Microsoft launched its AI, I'm continuing this article, Microsoft launched its AI-boosted version of Bing on Tuesday, the day after Google, yeah, the day after, the day after Google did their presentation. And uh, it looks to me like, uh, you know, Microsoft, what's really crazy is Google has been into this AI thing especially like typing messages into a chat window and speaking with an AI. Google's been into this for like six years, deeply. So much so that sometime last year, one of their AI engineers came out and said that he thought that Google's AI is sentient. And he started going out publicly saying this. And Google, of course, fired him because, you know, in big organizations like that, you don't just go off the reservation and start saying scary things. But was that really a scary thing that that guy said? If we have a global multi-billion dollar tech company that's been developing AI for years and years and years, why is it a scary thing that you can't have one of your employees going out there telling people that uh, the AI seems to be sentient? Why is that something that you're frightened by or that you view to be something the public shouldn't hear. Isn't that the whole thing you're going for? I'm not saying I want AI to be sentient, and I'm not saying the public shouldn't be in any way concerned by that. What I'm saying is Google as a company, the people who are actually developing this, con con uh, this technology, why are they frightened by the idea of 
the sentience of their AI being openly discussed. That I, isn't that the goal? Isn't that what they're going for? Like if you start working on AI and you pour billions of dollars into it for years, I thought the whole idea was it's intelligence. It's artificial intelligence. So therefore, when you have what actually can be called artificial intelligence rather than just a glorified Siri or a glorified Google Assistant, a glorified Alexa, um, when you have actual artificial intelligence, it seems to me it's going to be perceived by human beings as being sentient. How is that something that needs to be kept under the rug? You know, we need to keep that, you know, no, keep that in the closet. Keep that tucked away. Don't let the public hear that. Mm. Fire him. Fire him. It seems to me he was just simply revealing that Google achieved what anyone working on such technology would want to achieve. I don't see the problem there, but they fired the guy. Well, Google has been into this for so long that it was last year this guy came out and said this. And Microsoft has already eaten their lunch. Uh, Microsoft's like a year ahead of Google uh, on this. That's pretty much the broader perception of the situation. Uh, go go to uh, YouTube. There's a, there's a channel that I really love. It's called Cold Fusion. They talk about various events uh, that occur around the world, whether it's a political event or a financial event or a technology event, not events like, hey, everyone's gathered together for the annual. No, I mean like an occurrence, you know, a news story, something that happened. Um, it just covers those types of things. The, the channel is called Cold Fusion, and they recently did two videos about the Google versus Microsoft AI situation. And I strongly recommend <clears throat> that you take a look at those two videos. It's going to give you some great perspective on the situation. Uh, but having said all of this, um, despite the fact that Microsoft appears to... Oh, be, <laughs> by the way, yeah, you can now go to the new Bing, but you can't use it. So if you think you're going to go there and use the new Bing, forget about it. Uh, all you can do is get yourself placed on a waiting list. So they're apparently going with the old-fashioned... Make them wait for access, uh, false scarcity, manufactured scarcity approach that Gmail employed back in the day, back in the early 2000s when Gmail became a thing. That's the route they're going to go with the new Bing. And um, <clears throat> I'm on the waiting list, as should you be. Uh, and we'll see what happens here as far as how long it takes me to get into this. They do say they do have a button you can click there that allows you to get. Uh, accelerated access to it. But in order to get access, you have to accept Microsoft's security defaults in Windows. So Microsoft is actually going, in order to not have to wait so long to get access to this, Microsoft wants to force me to accept the, all of their Windows defaults. So I've got to use their default browser, Edge. I've got to make my Windows account, a Microsoft account, rather than just a local Windows account, and probably a host of other options that they're going to force upon me. Um, and I think there's something else you have to do as well. I can't remember what it was, but I'm not going to go through all that. I'm just going to wait. Um, and I have to say, though, that I've already said Bing is my default search and I've never done that before. I'm wondering how many other people have done that as well, just in anticipation of what's coming from Bing and what the numbers look like at Google. Because I'm thinking you walk into that place in Mountain View right now at the Google headquarters. I'm thinking there are some people with beads of sweat rolling down their face right now. I'm thinking they're not feeling too great about what's happening. And it always goes this way. You have some kind of uh, giant monolithic player in a particular industry and they seem insurmountable and suddenly something happens that just turns them upside down. It's sort of akin to, you know, Kodak was the first to develop digital photography technology, like in a useful way, in a way that could have been delivered to consumers. But they didn't release it. They didn't want to push it to market because they were afraid that it was going to cannibalize their existing film business, their existing film camera business. So they kept it on the back burner. Well, guess what? Somebody else went ahead and cannibalized their product for them. 
I guess if you take a business class in college, when I was in college, I didn't study business, but I'm assuming that if you study business in college, one of the first things you're going to learn is that if you're not willing to cannibalize your own product, somebody else is going to come along to cannibalize your product. Uh, it's kind of like, uh, you know, if you if Apple had been afraid to cannibalize the iPod, the iPhone never would have been uh, released to the public because it was an obvious cannibalization of the iPod. Since not only do you have an iPod and an iPhone, you also have all this other crap that makes the iPhone infinitely more appealing than an iPod. So Google is kind of the Kodak in this situation. AI tech is sort of the digital photography uh, that Kodak didn't want to release to the public. And um, let's say Microsoft is the... Nikon coming along with digital cameras to go ahead and cannibalize the product for them. I guess it was, I don't know who the first major digital camera producer was, but it definitely was not Kodak. Of course, eventually Kodak came along, but by then it was too late, which is a shame because when they did come along, they actually made some pretty fantastic digital cameras. Anyway, so if you happen to catch the Super Bowl tonight, you probably saw that uh, there was an ad placed somewhere along the, uh, what is a, what's a Super Bowl broadcast? Is it about two hours, two or three hours? Somewhere in the two or three hour broadcast, uh, electric car maker Tesla took a hit on the broadcast when an ad played showing the alleged dangers of its full self-driving technology. The commercial is part of a multi-million dollar advertising campaign by the Dawn Project. Its founder has dedicated millions of his own money to the cause. The ad cost $598,000. You know, I'm surprised that you can get a Super Bowl ad for $598,000. That seems a little bit low to me. I thought people were paying like a couple of million dollars to get an ad on the Super Bowl. No? I guess I'm wrong. Maybe that's for a full minute. Maybe this is a 30-second ad. I don't know. But I don't see how you could squeeze all of this stuff into a 30-second ad because apparently the ad shows a Tesla Model 3, which is allegedly uh, running with the full self-drive mode turned on, running over a child-sized dummy on a school crosswalk, and then a fake baby in a stroller. In the ad, the car swerves into oncoming traffic, zooms past, stops school buses, and cruises through do-not-enter signs. Is that really profoundly different than the sort of driving we get from actual human beings anyway? I mean, I guess I'm being facetious in saying that, but <laughs> I know you expect better from a computer. I, I get it. I'm, I guess I'm being silly. Maybe the uh, AI behind Tesla's self-driving algorithms, maybe it's so smart that it knew it was a dummy and it knew it was a fake baby. <laughs> And it was like, fuck this dummy. And it just plowed right through it. <clears throat> I don't know. I'm just uh, throwing ideas out there. Hopefully it works. I run into people um, all the time who seem to think that it, it's just not going to happen. People are not going to accept self-driving tech, particularly people who drive a truck. Because years ago I drove a truck. And so I know people who drive trucks. And I have people in my family who drive trucks, and they don't seem to be particularly receptive toward the idea of this eventually becoming mainstreamed. And, and I don't mean in terms of accepting it, accepting it. Of course, they don't want to accept it because that really eliminates a lot of jobs for human beings. They don't think it's going to happen. And I'm telling you, this is going to happen. I don't care how many commercials they run. I don't care how many dummies it plows over. I don't care how many fake baby strollers get smashed to dust on a fake driving course. This stuff's happening, and there's no stopping it. I remember back in 2010, 2011, Google had its self-driving car initiative, and they had this sensor mounted on top of the car spinning, doing a complete 360-degree image of the entire environment. This thing is spinning around like 90 times every second and generating a three-dimensional image of the entire surroundings every time it spins. This is happening 90 times per second. There's no way a human being can have that level of attention 
to the ever-changing environment around them as they're driving a, a motor vehicle. That's just not possible for a human being. You cannot compete as a human being with self-driving technology. Sorry, you can't. And yes, I understand there are examples of Teslas running over dummies, run, running over fake babies, plowing through actual gates in gated neighborhoods. I've seen that, where someone's driving down a road into a gated neighborhood, and when they hit the actual gate for the neighborhood, they literally hit it and plow through it. Uh, I've seen that. There are videos of this stuff. I get that. We're still sort of in the early days, but in five or ten years, we will no longer be in the early days of self-driving tech. It's coming. There's nothing you or I or anyone can do about it. And frankly, I think the sooner the better. I, I don't want human beings having the option of controlling a motor vehicle because we're not good at it, okay? I understand. Oh, well, fuck you, Michael. I'm good at it. I, don't, I, I can drive my own car. I don't know. Fuck you. You can't. You're not good at it. You play with your phone while you're driving. You reach for your sodas and your coffees as you're driving. You're dropping cigarettes in your lap as you're driving. You're looking back to yell at your kids as you're driving. You're getting flustered because you're missing turns. You're daydreaming. You're falling asleep. You suck. Humans suck when it comes to being trusted behind the wheel of a motor vehicle. They just suck at it. That includes you. That includes me. That includes all of us. Every one of us, when it comes to driving a motor vehicle, are an accident waiting to happen. It's just a question of will you die before you have your major accident and become a part of the statistic pool? Which happens first? You die or the accident? <clears throat> Perhaps the accident is what causes you to die. I don't know. But humans suck at this. They're not good at it. Despite how threatened you may feel by the idea of self-driving car tech, so what? It's coming. And there's nothing you're going to be able to do about it. It's going to take over everything. And I promise you that at some point in the future, children will be taken aback by stories from their grandparents of what it was like when human beings were allowed to drive cars. Kids are going to be like, what? You used to be able to drive your own car? You used to be able to control the car? Really? That's wild. And why is it that we have all these ads against Tesla here, obviously attempting to impede the advancement of self-driving tech. Yet, I'm seeing videos all over YouTube of people getting into driverless taxis and being shuttled around the place all over Las Vegas without a single problem. I'm not seeing any videos being posted with accidents uh, as it relates to these driverless taxis. I feel like I'm in the uh, late 1800s where they were saying, Motor horseless carriages! No, I'm saying motorless taxes. I think it's all a bunch of fluff, if you ask me. <laughs> They've got these taxis all over Vegas now. There are videos all over the place of people getting in these things. I'm not seeing any complaints about uh, baby strollers getting crashed into or people getting tossed around inside the, uh, inside the taxi like a, a bingo ball. I'm not hearing any of that stuff. It seems like it's only against Tesla. <laughs> And I, I really don't get it. I, and, and you know something? These uh, tests that they are doing in order to film the Tesla car crashing into the dummy or crashing into the fake baby stroller, I would like to know how many iterations of these tests they had to set up. How many iterations of the scenario where we got the dummy in this position, uh, we got the stroller in that position, uh, we got the school bus with the stop sign extended. It's right here. How many iterations of this did they have to set up for each of those three scenarios in order to get the Tesla car not to do what it's supposed to do? I get it. You would want the Tesla car never to do what it's not supposed to do. I get that. But I, I'm kind of curious as to how many iterations of this had to be set up. And this is all predicated on the idea that self-driving tech should never have an accident. Well, why? Why is that standard being applied to self-driving tech, but it's not applied to human beings? I would submit to you, if you're willing to apply that standard to any form of self-driving tech, that it should never have an accident. And if it does, that demonstrates the inadequacy of the tech. 
If you're willing to say that about self-driving tech, okay, then are you willing to agree that any human being who has an accident on the road and is deemed to be at fault should be forever banned from driving? I don't think you're willing to say that. I don't think anybody's willing to say that. And I don't think there's anybody willing to hold a human being to the standard of never having an accident anyway, regardless of what the ultimate penalty for having one is. So why is that standard being applied to self-driving tech? I, I don't quite understand that. <clears throat> Ten years from now, self-driving tech is going to be everywhere. These cars are going to be infinitely safer. They're going to be infinitely more reliable. If anybody should be worried about self-driving tech, it's municipalities that get a huge percentage of their uh, uh, city operating revenue through DUIs and various other motor vehicle infractions <laughs> resulting from somebody driving under the influence. What happens when that goes away? What does your munis municipality do in order to fund all of the bullcrap that they currently are able to fund as a result of, uh, you know, pulling someone over and nailing them on a point oh eight one rather than a point oh uh, eight? I would be curious as to how they're going to fund all of those nice little projects. Um, yeah, this this uh, this Dawn project says Tesla's full self driving is endangering the public. This was in their ad. With deceptive marketing and woefully inept engineering. Well, good luck with that. You can fight this all you want. It's not going anywhere. Twitter's internal chaos is slowly uh, is slowing Turkey earthquake relief efforts. Okay, so they're, they're still not done going after Elon Musk after buying Twitter. I don't even really feel like reading this article. I'll summarize it. Um, there were a bunch of people using Twitter to find photos and videos of accidents after the earthquake in Turkey. They were using the geolocation tagging information from the photos and the videos that were taken and forwarding that information on to rescuers so that they could dig and look for people. And uh, so the idea is that because Twitter is now painfully unreliable that it's hindering efforts for uh, of these people to get these people, the earthquake victims, dug out from under the debris. I have been using Twitter on a daily basis, multiple times per day, ever since Elon took this thing over. I've not noticed a single hiccup. Not once. The service has never been down. It's never failed to refresh for me when I drag down to refresh. Nothing. I've not noticed a single issue. So what's the problem here? I remember back in the old days when Twitter initially blew up. You remember the old Twitter fail whale? How many times per day you would see that thing? And back then it was like, oh, there's the Twitter fail whale. It became a meme. It was some sort of cute little thing. Oh, it's, you know, we excuse Twitter's inadequacy and ineptitude and uh, incompetence because, well, they've got a cute little whale. And it's called the fail whale. So they present you with that. It's almost as fun as the little jumping dinosaur that you get in the Google Chrome window when you can't when you get a 404 error and you can't load a web page. It's almost as fun as that. But it's significantly more popular than that. The fail whale. It was excused. It was almost a cutesy little thing. Oh, Twitter's down. Isn't that adorable? Now, fast forward, you got someone else who owns the website who maybe isn't quite as politically aligned with the worldview of the previous management. And suddenly, one of the bathrooms at Twitter runs out of toilet paper and everybody's pissing and moaning about how poorly run the company is. I mean, I have not had one problem with Twitter. And frankly, the fact that it continues to run as well as it does, and I've seen actually some changes. Uh, there is... Now, at least in Android, when you open the Twitter app, you've got two tabs up at the top. There's a following tab, which are the people that you follow with their tweets in chronological order. So there's no algorithm deciding what you should see and where it should be in the timeline and all this bull crap. No, that's not what anybody wants. You want the pe only the people you're following and you want to see their tweets in order. Well, you now have that. And then there's another tab, I think it's called For You, where it gives you the algorithm deciding what you should see. You might see a tweet from 16 hours ago followed by a tweet from 30 minutes ago. 
And they could be from people you follow or maybe from people you don't follow. The algorithm thinks you might be interested in it anyway. So here it is. Well, this is a new feature. Wow, how are there any new features considering all of these profoundly important people that have been fired at Twitter? How could there possibly be any new features in the Twitter app right now? Not only are there new features, but it continues to work for me. So I have to tell you, I don't quite get the uh, problem people are having. And by the way, <clears throat> if you want to take the time to spend tens of hours scouring uh, Twitter photos and videos of earthquake rubble in Turkey, you probably would be, especially if you're one of 20,000 people doing this, according to this article, maybe it would be more useful to just get on a plane and go to Turkey and help. I don't know. Yahoo is laying off thousands of people and... It's interesting to think that Yahoo even has thousands of people working there. I, uh, that's, that's, that surprises me to begin with, but apparently they do. They have enough people working there to fire thousands of people. And I kind of looked into it, and here are all the Yahoo properties. There's Yahoo Search, which remember that used to be powered by Yahoo, and then it was powered by... I think it was powered by Bing for a while, but it still had the Yahoo search wrapper. Then that partnership fell away, and I guess now it's just Yahoo search again. There's Yahoo Mail, which I can't imagine why anybody is using that at this point. Yahoo News, Yahoo Finance, Yahoo Sports, Yahoo Weather, Yahoo Answers, Yahoo Entertainment, in, in case the previous seven categories were not enough for you. Yahoo Lifestyle. Boy, that sounds like a hoot. Uh, Flickr, Tumblr. Did you know that those two are owned by Yahoo? Yahoo Directory, Yahoo Groups, Yahoo Maps, Yahoo Shopping, Yahoo Small Business, Yahoo Autos. I'm tired of saying Yahoo, honestly. Yahoo Real Estate, Yahoo Travel, Yahoo Health. And that is not an exhaustive list, but that's everything I was able to find. I had no idea there were that many properties at Yahoo. So apparently there are thousands of people working at Yahoo still. Imagine telling people that you work at Yahoo and just the looks of concern and sympathy you would get from people as soon as you tell them that they would just immediately, their brain would click over to, oh, I'm sorry that you have such inadequate job security. Anything could happen at any moment, couldn't it? I'm so sorry. It'd almost be like telling somebody 10 years ago that you work at AOL. The Mars Curiosity rover finds evidence of water where it was expected to be dry. Okay, listen to this. The key to understanding whether Mars was ever, ever habitable is water. And we know there was once liquid water on the surface of Mars. Recently, the Curiosity rover has made an intriguing discovery suggesting that water was once present in an area that scientists had thought would be dry. The unusual thing about this discovery is its location. The rover is currently climbing up a mountain, which is uh, the point that this rover is at, is about a half a mile from the mountain's base. And the researchers expect to find drier conditions when they get there, but instead they find evidence that there was once a shallow lake here. This is what I don't get. They're, they're wording this as if the Mars science, uh, the uh, NASA scientists controlling the rover expected to find dry conditions there, but then they were shocked because they got there and they found dry conditions. <laughs> That's how it's written here. They got halfway up a mountain, which is dry, and they found dry conditions, but they were surprised because they expected to find dry conditions when, when they got there. I mean, I get what they're saying, that you know they're halfway up a mountain and they're finding what they think was the bottom of a lake bed, but uh, yeah, once there was a shallow lake there. Well, that's pretty interesting. So if you're halfway up a mountain on Mars and you're finding what used to be a shallow lake bed, then clearly Mars had some sort of a plate tectonic system be below the surface. I wonder, does Mars still have a molten core? 
I don't think it does because I think the idea is that the uh, molten core is what generates the magnetic uh, layer that surrounds the planet. The magnetosphere, is that what it's called? And that that protects the atmosphere from uh, solar energy that slowly over time pushes nitrogen and oxygen atoms out into space. Like that's, I think, the idea that if you don't have some sort of a protective layer that protects the atmosphere from solar energy <clears throat> colliding with the atmosphere over time, very teeny tiny, insignificant, minuscule atomic level bits of your atmosphere get blasted out into space as this solar wind strikes the atmosphere. And I don't know if this is still the operating theory, but at one time I had heard or read that this was the idea of what happened to Mars, that uh, they lost the magnetic like layer, the magnetosphere. I don't even know for sure if that's what it's called. But the core was no longer molten, and as a result of that, they no longer had this magnetic shield around the planet. I keep saying they, like, listen, those Martians, those poor people, you need to take a moment and think about those people. You need to take a moment and appreciate what you have, because those people up there, they lost it, okay? They lost it. So you need to take a moment and be appreciative of what you got. You got a magnetosphere here. You got some fucking magnetic protection around this planet. You don't even appreciate it. You're sitting there laughing to them Martians. They're dead. You don't even care. I'm, you don't even care. I'm done with you. They. The planet, I should say. The planet Mars, that's the theory, that that's how it lost its atmosphere. Although it still has not lost its atmosphere. I, I, it, Mars does have an atmosphere. It's uh, just nothing like the composition of ours. I think it's something like 1 20th the density of our atmosphere. I mean, it's as close to pretty much not having an atmosphere as you could get while still saying you have an atmosphere, I guess. Anyway, this is Is This Secure? It's a podcast about technology. I hope you enjoyed the show tonight. I'm Michael. Curtis will be here next time, I think. And uh, in the meantime, take a look at our website. It is isthissecure.com. My YouTube channel, M. Van Dieven. Ta.